Isaiah, hello. What's up, man? How's it going? Hey, everybody in the chat. I have the chat open, by the way. So be nice. I'm reading the chat as we go. Come on, somebody. Isaiah is the pro uh, of this. And, um, you know, I was watching the the preview of the Domino Revival, which, by the way, is coming out in just less than two weeks. The Domino Revival is coming out, and I had a chance. I missed the premiere, but uh, Pastor Mike was very gracious to give me um, a sneak peek of that. And so I was watching that. I was really moved by everything that the Lord has done. And honestly, kind of seeing a consistency in the fact that, Isaiah, you were the connection point between all the demon slayers and even inspiring everyone to go online and minister and you placed a, you played a big role um, in my life when it comes to YouTube inspiring me challenging me firing me up and I first heard of you actually from my friend Slavic at G4T Church of Truth he was telling me about this uh, guy who just yells and who has his passion to reach people and who does not do any marketing, any social media, but just revival is organically breaking out, which we're going to get to in just a moment. And so, um, and then I remember I just went under YouTube and I looked at it. I was like, man, I was like, wow, why is he yelling all the time? Why is he screaming all the <laughs> why time? Why doesn't he breathe? I'm like, how is he able to like do the nonstop for 40 minutes? I was like, this is some kind of a machine. This is not a person. And, uh, and then, you know, when we made a connection and you visited Hungry Chen and it was impactful, it was very powerful. And then the, the COVID happened and seeing you go on the line and ministering and God blessing your ministry and you exposing also me to online speaking, you know, into my life, into that regard. And in fact, this room that I'm in right now wasn't supposed to be a studio. After you, you visited, this became a studio. Come on. So... Isaiah, I appreciate you, your wife, your ministry, and everything that God's been doing through your life. And I want to just echo that back to you. I really appreciate you having me on your platform. I always joke and say, I walk so you can run because you have just <laughs> taken off on social media. The platform has grown. And I want to say something too with the numbers. You guys hear us, you, know, you hit a million subscribers, you hit this. This is all for the glory of God. Everything we're saying tonight and doing, this is not about us. It's not about a man. This is to reach souls and to preach the gospel to every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. And then the end will come, the Bible says. And I know right now, Vlad, with everything going on in Israel, there's a lot of talk about this is the end of the world and the end times. But the Bible makes it clear that once the gospel is preached to the entire world, then the end will come. So actually, more than earthquakes and wars and famines mm -hmm. is bringing on the end time. Come Tonight, on. as we preach the gospel, we're actually ushering in the end times through the preaching of the gospel. The more people that are reached, once everybody hears the gospel, Jesus said, then the end will come. And so, man, you're doing that. You're reaching millions of people on social media. These numbers are not vain. They're not pointless. Mm -hmm. These are our family members in these numbers that Come are getting on. saved, getting healed, getting delivered. These are our friends in these numbers. So when we see these big numbers, they're not worthless. These are real people that are being changed by the gospel. And so I want to just thank you for having me on. I don't take it lightly. I know we're friends and some of the people watching might go, oh, well, it's expected you guys bring each other on. It's not expected. I appreciate it. I'm honored by it. I'm humbled by it. You are a straight up Bible teacher, no matter what anyone would say. Mm -hmm. You teach the word of God. You put in the time, you put in the energy, you put in the effort. And all the subscribers, all the numbers, all those sale, book sales, you you deserve it. You've put the work in. You know, you partnered with the Holy Spirit in this. And I just want to honor you. Thank you. I love you and your wife. You guys are amazing. Thanks for having me. Even before I was quote unquote, and I'm going to use these, look at everyone clearly, these quotes. <laughs> Before I was famous, you had me in and uh, you actually told me to go on social media. And I'm like, ah, I don't do social media. The Holy Ghost will promote me. And then when the Lord told me in 2019 to go on social media, mm -hmm. I ended up going back and I told you about it. And I knew you're the same as me. Your, your gear started turning. You were up all night and started the YouTube. And man, I'm like, right now I'm looking down at your, your subs and your views and all. I'm just blown away. I felt like a proud youtube father <laughs> to see you guys all just taking off and growing but you guys are putting the work in it's not gimmicky yeah. it's not clickbait you guys yeah. are legitimately putting the work in and i'm proud of you guys and i'm just trying to be just hang on and be a part of what you guys are doing no i think that I, and i really appreciate you because i feel like something that we share in common is that some people build their platform around uh, drama around yes. toxicity and just really just going after uh just non-essentials and I think that's something that you're doing and same thing that I'm trying to do is really just focus on on biblical teaching expose people to freedom and deliverance and not just focus on deliverance but focus on other components of the Bible yes. and to really just build people up instead of trying to build my platform 
using people to actually build people using the platform. And I think God sees the heart yeah. and mo motive and he chooses to bless it. And so um, it's incredible. But Isaiah, you know, a lot of people see the glory. They, they don't know the story. And um, where did you come from? Yeah, so I was born and raised in San Jose, California. Yes, I'm from California. To all of you out there that are like, California's gonna fall in the ocean, here we are. You know, I'm here in California preaching the gospel, preaching holiness, standing for righteousness. I know many of you want me to move to Texas or Florida or Washington, but hey, if I leave, what's gonna happen to California? So I believe in Jesus' name, California will be saved. I'm a California just my whole life. When I was eight or nine years old, my parents moved us from San Jose, which if you guys don't know where San Jose is, it's by San Francisco, like maybe 30, mm -hmm. 40 minutes, a little less, a little more, depending on the traffic. And we moved to a city called Manteca, California, where we bought five acres. And I grew up, went from straight city to growing up in the country in Manteca, California. And that's where I was raised and had just an amazing upbringing, amazing parents. You hear a lot of people share their testimony of all the hell they went through. The only hell I went through was the hell I put myself through. But as far as my family, I never saw my mom or dad cuss ever. I never saw either of them drink were they, ever. Uh, were they my believers, mom is never... Isaiah? Were they believers? Yeah, go ahead. W yes, uh, yes, were your they parents were believers. believers. Yep, they homeschooled us, raised us in church. I was full on homeschooled, never went to a public school, never went to a private school. Uh -huh. The first time I went to school was when I went to college, and that was at 16 years old. But I was raised just very, very sheltered. And mm -hmm. I know, Vlad, that's very negative for some people. They say we shouldn't shelter our kids. But in my opinion, if you just Google the word shelter, it means protection from a storm. And mm. so I'm I'm a big advocate of we need to protect our kids. We need to shelter our kids mm -hmm. from what's happening in the world. Mm -hmm. And I was extremely sheltered and uh, moved to Manteca, California, grew up in the country. And that was just kind of part of my upbringing, raised in church. Again, amazing, hardworking parents, never saw abuse. My dad worked 14 hours, 16 hours a day was mm -hmm. at every game we had, was taking us dirt wow. biking. We had horses, we had property. We just had such an amazing childhood. And my parents really gave us the best they could, the God the, in the best way they could. Mm -hmm. And when we moved out here to the Central Valley, mm -hmm. we were going when I was younger to a more spirit-filled church when I was young, I couldn't remember really. And then when we moved out here, we went to just kind of like a country Baptist church, I would mm -hmm. say. So there was no, just for context, miracles, deliverance signs and wonders there was no holy ghost i didn't mm -hmm. see the baptism i didn't see ever saw deliverance i never saw miracles i never heard about that mm -hmm. i can never remember hearing about any of that it was just kind of a vanilla conventional church and i want to make this very clear it's possible you're watching tonight and you're raised in church but not raised in christ it's possible mm -hmm. that you're watching tonight and you grew up in a pew but didn't grow up in christ and there's a lot of people that mm -hmm. they think because they go to this 90 minute god this 90 minute jesus they somehow know God. But friend, I didn't know God. Although I had an amazing family, I had wow. an amazing parents, I had an amazing upbringing. It's not enough for all of you parents that think, I'm just gonna bring my kids and drop them off at youth, work really hard, have a good house, have a nice car. It'll be enough. It's not enough. It's not enough. You need to give them the Holy Spirit. You need to get them in an atmosphere with mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit. So I wanna say that in the, the beginning of my testimony, I didn't have that. And my parents are both watching. I love them to death. They're amazing, but they didn't put us in that environment hmm. where the Holy Spirit was moving. Mm -hmm. And so that was that was me, man, mm -hmm. homeschooled, living that life. And then I, I got into a metal band probably at the age of, I think, 13 or 14. How I many, playing if, drums if, we like, can, if we can pause for the, just a second yeah, before yeah. the metal band, how many times did you almost die as a kid? Oh, man. So it's not, it's really crazy. I don't know if I've ever met anyone that's almost died as many times as I, as I have almost died. And my aunt even said something to my mom growing up. She said this, there must be a special calling on his life because the devil keeps trying to kill him. And time and time again, I mean, I'm talking, I almost drowned, literally almost drowned twice. Wow, I fell wow. out of a car when I was a, a young kid, literally fell out of the car rolling down the street. A second time, I almost fell out of the car on the highway. I was hanging over the highway on my door. My mom pulled me back in. Wow. At 12 years old, I was actually at a friend of mine's house and I just watched that movie, uh, American Outlaws at the time most popular. I was probably 12 years old and I had heard about Jesse James and the Outlaws and they were they were hanging each other. The Outlaws would get hung by mm -hmm. you know the sheriff and stuff. And so I was joking. We were in a large metal barn there was a, a big metal chain that would go and pull out engines and transmissions. My mom wasn't there. My friend's mom wasn't there. It was just me and my friend and my cousin. Mm -hmm. I was riding my bike. He was riding his bike. I got off my bike. I put this large metal chain around my neck like this. But mind you, my hands were in the chain. So I thought, 
no big deal. And I'm swinging back and forth on this large metal chain, not thinking much of it. And then my friend left the barn. My cousin left the barn. I'm by myself swinging on this large metal chain at 12 years old. And the next thing I know, I wake up and I'm, and I get a, oh, sorry. I get all emotional talking about it because it's just so real, but I, I wake up and I'm seeing my feet hanging off the ground. Well, what happened was as I was doing this messing around mm -hmm. and I want to know, I wasn't trying to take my life. And so mm -hmm. I want to make that very clear. It was, mm -hmm. a, it was an accident. I was hanging like this as a joke and my hand somehow came out of the rope. I passed out and I started wow. spinning on the rope. It was a chain. Mm -hmm. And I, on that metal chain, I spun into the air. And so now I'm staring at my feet. My hands are to my side and I'm just like, thinking I'm dead. I'm having this out of body experience, almost like I'm watching myself from above type of thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm just thinking, okay, I'm hanging. I'm dead. There's no, there's no way I'm getting down from here. My hands are to my side. I'm up in the air. 100%. I should have just stayed passed out and should have, should have been dead. I shouldn't be here today. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget Vlad. This is the only way I can describe it. The, and this is a weird way, but at 12, this is all I could think of the softest hands, softest hands I've ever felt reached into that rope i'm talking about hands reached into that rope opened up a metal chain which uh, many people watching this right now would say that's impossible that's actually my point it's completely impossible it's metal cool. rope mm -hmm. chain pulled open that metal chain i fell to the ground and i fell so high off the off mm -hmm. the chain that my knees were bruised i landed on my knees wow. i crawled to the corner of the barn everything was black like i couldn't really see and i was trying to catch my breath because mm -hmm. obviously i wasn't breathing for a certain amount of time mm -hmm. I'm slamming my hand on the concrete pavement, trying to get my breath back in my lungs. And Vlad, at 12 years old, a, a young kid who didn't believe in God and wasn't re was really running from God and didn't mm -hmm. really care about church, I look back and I see the chain still twisted up in the air. It wasn't like the chain untwisted, unraveled. It still tightened up and balled up, mm -hmm. chained in the air. Mm -hmm. And all I could think was, there's a war going on. Like something is trying to kill me. That's something crazy. just tried to take my life right now. And then in, in the same time, something else is intervening and save and save me. So I, I ride my bike a mile down the road. I lived a mile away. I get to my house. I'm bleeding from my neck. I have chain marks all over my neck. I'm literally bleeding from my neck, bleeding as I'm riding my bike. I call my mom. I'm crying. I'm screaming, mom, don't be mad. Don't be mad. And she's what I said, mom, don't be mad. I'm bawling on the phone. I just hung myself, mom. I didn't mean to an angel. Oh. My mom's crying, screaming. She was at a horse event with my sister's mm -hmm. race. They used to race horses. They all come home. All our friends and family, there's probably 30, 40 of us, friends and family, all meet at our house. Everybody's crying, praising God, thanking God for saving me. And I didn't really realize until about a year after I got saved, I was praying one day and the Lord said, Isaiah, I didn't pull you off that rope. I pulled America off that rope. I didn't pull you off that rope. I pulled all the people you're going to reach off the rope. See, what I didn't realize, Vlad, was it wow. wasn't God just saving me that day, mm -hmm. but God was also the every person that I was going to reach and preach to and evangelize to mm. that have gotten saved, not because of me, but through our ministry, mm -hmm. also, were get, God was also sparing them because somebody's wow. life is on the other side of our obedience. Like mm -hmm. today, if, tonight, as you're watching this, I'm, I'm reading the chat. If you mm -hmm. say no to God, if you say no to God tonight and say, I don't want to serve God like I used to be, I used to say, F God, I don't want to serve God. Someone will go to hell because of your disobedience. Someone that God has called you to reach. Mm -hmm. This is how God reaches people. Second Corinthians chapter five, God speaks through us as his ambassadors. Mm -hmm. So you can't afford to be stubborn. So you good. can't afford to keep telling God no. And I did this Vlad for mm -hmm. years. You would think, mm -hmm. of course, now what did you serve God? No. I live stubbornly continually. I almost died again. I got drugged under a, basically a trailer broke behind a, a very large, large tractor. Me and my brother were in a trailer. It broke and flipped upside down. And the tractor was so loud and going, you know, 20 to 30 miles down mm -hmm. the road, massive John Deere tractor that the guy driving, a friend of ours, didn't know the trailer broke and flipped when he turned the corner. Oh. He drug us under a broken trailer, 20 to 30-ish miles an hour on, on, on the street about a mile down the road. And in that time, I had a legitimate out-of-body experience. I came out of that broken trailer and I just saw myself being drugged down the down the road and felt as if something was in that trailer with me. I can't explain it. Was it an angel? Was it God? It was, it was something that saved me. Mm -hmm. We get to the house. He freaks out. He's screaming. Our family runs out because we were in the country screaming. They flip the trailer. I should have been dead. 
I should have been 100 percent dead, mm -hmm. and I just have a little tiny scrape and scar on my arm from that. God spared me again, and it was Vlad over and over, time but and why time. Were you, you know, we Isaiah, had, in, in the spite of all these divine interventions, why, as a younger person growing up in in church, growing up in a godly home, you absolutely had no reason to be bitter, to be hard headed, and to be stubborn. Why were you so hard headed and bitter toward God growing up as a teenager? Yeah, well, if you don't, what I've learned is if you don't allow God to work in your life, you allow another spirit to work in your life. If you don't allow the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. to work in you, then there's another spirit. The Bible calls it the spirit of disobedience. And, mm -hmm. and we are called the sons of disobedience. So although I didn't have this traumatic background or traumatic upbringing, mm -hmm. I did, uh, we'll talk about later, get involved in drinking and partying mm -hmm. and the metal scene and all that. I was, I, I allowed the devil to work in my life. I was bitter. Mm. I was hard hearted. I got angry and I don't know. I don't know why it was. I think I was aimless. Those of you that aren't serving God, you're aimless. You don't mm -hmm. have any, anything to aim to. You have no purpose, no mm -hmm. direction, no reason to get out of bed. And so I found myself getting, you know, wanting to be a police officer my whole life. That was my dream. I want to be a police officer. And they said, oh, you'll grow out of it. And then I, high school, I want to be a police officer. They said, you'll grow out of it. And then I started college. I got a degree in administration of justice, was getting hired as a police officer. And in that whole world, I just got hard hearted. I just got bitter. I just got angry. There's some people watching. And I just, I know Vlad, I'm kind of talking to the chat, to the people watching as well, but I want to mm -hmm. just prophesy over someone that has a heart of stone right now. You are mm -hmm. just like I was. You don't even know why. Right. And Vlad, I didn't know why. Mm -hmm. Why did I have this heart of stone? Why was I angry? Vlad, I was racist towards my own race. Like how demonic is that? I was so demonized. And the Bible says in Ezekiel, God will take your heart of stone. Man, I feel the Holy Spirit mm. and give you a heart of flesh. And I had a hard heart. This is what the devil does in our life. Mm. He gives us a heart of stone. He makes us bitter. He makes us angry. And that was me for no reason. I didn't ever take any pictures. I was just always mad at a very dark countenance mm -hmm. physically i had big dark circles around my eyes if you maybe wow. i took two to three pictures in a 10 year period and that's a fact you could ask my parents they will validate that in the chat i took maybe two or three pictures in 10 years i, I didn't cry for 10 years i just became this hard-hearted to myself living a secret life young man started playing drums at 12 started getting into metal music which is uh worldly metal music is very demonic mm -hmm. i got into playing shows and man, it, my life just started spiraling from there. Although raised in church, raised in the best family you can imagine, my parents did such a good job. The devil really just started having his way with me. And then you you actually even went further where you totally walked away from your faith, walked away from any belief in Christ. And you actually, be, did you actually become an atheist? Yeah, I say I was the worst, worst atheist ever because I wasn't going around championing atheism. I wasn't uh -huh. going around trying to be a spokesperson for atheism. I just didn't believe in God. I just didn't believe there was a God. And if there was, so maybe I was a bit agnostic mixed trying to, cause I, I was like a wannabe atheist. So I, I said, hey, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. But I think if only a fool says in his heart, there is no God. And I don't think there's really a such thing as someone who truly doesn't believe there's a God. But I said it the best I could. And I got to a place where 14, 15, 15 and a half, I got a job. I started working purposely mm -hmm. every Sunday morning and every Wednesday night. So wow. I didn't go to church anymore. So at the age of about 15 and a half, 16, I stopped going to church completely, turned my back on God and just said, mm -hmm. there is no God. And this is why I didn't see him ever move in my life. Mm -hmm. There was no real reality at church. I expected to see God move in the church and I didn't. I expected to see the reality. Somehow you guys talk about this massive amazing god but where are his works where are his miracles where is his power where is, where is there anyone living this thing out for real like walking holy walking in the power of the holy spirit walking i wanted that so bad i i so badly wanted there to be a god and i remember countless nights vlad laying in bed looking at my ceiling and there's someone watching this you could relate you you may be mm -hmm. even crying right now because this is you and i would think there has to be more to life than this the parties, mm. the drinking, the girls, the it's like every day it's the same drink, the same people. And I'm laying in bed going, there has to be more to life than this. And deep down, Vlad, mm -hmm. although I was a bunny ear atheist, quote unquote atheist, something in me started crying out for something more. Something mm. in me said, there has to be more to life. And I started watching documentaries about how the world's going to end. And mm -hmm. so in 2010, 
I start watching all of these documentaries on Netflix. We're running out of food. We're running out of water. Everything's running out. It's the end of the world. And I'm at these parties, mind you, again, I was in a metal band. We got pretty well known. We did tours. We did a lot of shows. And I'm in that band. I'm I'm well known. I'm partying. I'm, I got into drinking. You know, I'm with this girl, but I'm sleeping around with other people, just living a dark, depressed, bitter life, wow. hiding it from my parents. And then on the other side, I'm working 40 hours a week. I'm 19 units in school. Started college at 16 years old, taking wow. 19 units while working 40 hours. I mean, I was just nonstop doing something. And I'm starting to think there has to be more to life than just working 40 hours a week mm -hmm. at Starbucks and then taking 19 units at, of college and then trying to become a, a police officer. And so I'm, I'm thinking that, and I'm, I'm nine, uh, 18 years, 19 years old and I'm just hurting. I'm broken. I'm lost. I'm three years out of church. So mm -hmm. I want to make this very clear when you guys see me preaching on stage or on the stream or whatever, Mm -hmm. I was the last person you could ever dream of to serve God. I, I was the farthest one. God, it wasn't even like, I wasn't even like in 30 years, I'll serve him. God was a hundred thousand wow. years and miles away from my mind. Zero interest. If you would have came and told me you're going to be a preacher one day, God's going to use you. I would have probably cussed you out. I would have been like, you're crazy. But God, man, the work God has done. And mm. I, I try to even say some of this without getting super emotional. It's unbelievable, Vlad. I feel like at any moment I'm going to wake up and it's going to be a dream. I'm mm -hmm. going to be like, whoa, I just had wow. a 13 year dream because it's so unbelievable what God did. So that led me to questions about there has to be more to life. Mm -hmm. And then my little sister begging me, you got to go to church for six months, Vlad. She's begging me. So oh, wow. again, remember Isaiah's ever the words, the F word. I'm uh -huh. drinking almost every day. Some days I didn't drink, but I got to a point where I was even drinking at work. I would get drunk, go to work, and then sober up, drive home. I would drink. I mean, I was just addicted to alcohol, addicted to pornography, bitter, angry, racist towards my own race, and just lonely, depressed, sleeping in, um, hiding all of this from my parents and my family. And then my little sister who's in the but chat your, right your now. Parents, but your parents were me. praying for you. I'm assuming your parents were oh, praying yes, for you. Your yes. sister was praying for you. So I didn't know Vlad, everyone was praying for me because I thought it on, on the exterior, uh -huh. I had it all together. I had straight A's. I had a good job. I had a, the girlfriend. I had like, I had my life together in, mm -hmm. in a secular sense. Yeah. I had the 40 year plan. I was going to buy a house at 21, all the stuff planned. I was going to get married, all the stuff planned. So when I found out after getting saved, everybody was praying for me. I'm like, why were you guys praying for me? You know, I, I was, I didn't think at the time anyone was praying for me, but mm. they knew man, this guy needs to get a hold of God. And, and they used to say like, man, if only Isaiah got saved, mm. he would be so radical. Because Vlad, you know me, if I talk about anything, like a, one of your team members when we were together recently was like, dude, are you like this? Are you passionate about everything? Because anything we talk about, I'm like screaming and shouting and excited. But my family said, man, if you get a hold of, if God get, got a hold of you, you would do, you'd be so wow. radical and passionate. And uh, man, and, sure and, enough, and here God, goes my sister six months of begging me. And God did get hold of you on uh, yes. January 12, 2011, on Wednesday night. What happened? Yeah, so my little sister's begging me, and I'll never forget. I remember the night clearly. My girlfriend was gonna go, was going to my sister saying, Hey, we're gonna go to church. Isaiah said, You've been bugging. And so, just to get you off, just to get you off his back, he agreed to go to church. And six plus months of her begging me. And she told me, this is one thing that stuck with me. She said, this church is different. This church, mm. you're going to feel something. You're going to feel someone. And I'm like that in my mind, Vlad, I said, mm -hmm. that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I've never felt anything at church, but condemnation. I was like, I'm not going to feel anything. Mm -hmm. And so my sister was like, not feeling good that day. Almost didn't even bring us to church that day, which is a whole nother crazy story. But my girlfriend said, come on, let's go. You've been begging. Isaiah finally agreed. So my sister, my girlfriend, me, and a friend of mine, we all went to church and I'll never forget. So I'm about to walk in the church and I tell myself this in my head. I say, this will be the last time I ever step foot in church, right? This is three wow. years of not going to church. And I've been raised in church. I went to all the vacation Bible schools, all the mm -hmm. purity conferences, my whole life in church. And then here I am now, years not going. And I said to myself, before walking through the door of the church in Modesto, California, mm -hmm. uh, Calvary Temple, now it's called the house. I said, I'll never step foot in the door of a church again. This will be the last night I ever step foot in a church again. And then I remember when I walked through the door, I felt something. Hmm. I don't know. I mean, I know now is the Holy Spirit, but at the time, mind you, I'm an atheist. And I was like, 
Whoa, I remember I could, man, I remember like yesterday, I, I walk in, I'm wow. like, something's in this room. Something's in here. I've never felt this. It's it's like something. And it wasn't like I was in the service mm -hmm. and everybody was shouting and screaming. I was in the foyer and I just knew something was here. And so we go in the service and it's a massive auditorium and, you know, they rope it off because they don't want the youth in the very back. And I was like sat, sat towards the back where you're mm -hmm. not really supposed to sit. And I was rebellious and, you know, whatever, this is stupid. And during the work, this is how far I was. And I know this will offend some people, but I want to show you how lost I was just so you can get a picture of if God can do it in me. And that's the whole, tonight is all about this. Yeah. If God can do it in me, God can do it in you. Mm -hmm. If God can use me, God can use you. And so I sat back there and I'm this lost. I saw the worship leader who I didn't know was the pastor's wife, the youth pastor's wife. And I'm at a youth service. And I started making sexual jokes about her to my, wow. my friend next to me at, in church. Like, who does that? Who's so demonized to make jokes about a worship leader? Your girlfriend's on this side, your wow. friend's on this side, and you're whispering to your friend dirty things about the one leading worship. So that's how far I was when God found me. So the guy gets up there, preaches about world missions. And I'm like, okay, this is not even really that relevant to me. But he made this statement. He said, January 12th, he said, do you want to be next year? in the same place you are this year and you were last year and you were the year before. And Vlad, I had this flashback when he said that during mm -hmm. the altar call, when he's trying to call everyone forward, mm -hmm. the last two to three years, same parties, same beer pong tournament. And mind you, I was at a beer pong tournament 13 days ago. So 13 days ago, I'm playing beer pong. Okay. Now I'm sitting here and he's saying, do you want to be in the same place? And I just realized, man, everything the world has to offer is the same soup reheated. It's the same parties, the same wow. drinking. There's nothing new. There's no value. Mm -hmm. It's completely dead. It's like the man at the tombs. I was just mm -hmm. hanging around dead people all the time. Mm -hmm. And so as he's saying this, you know, come up here. God mm -hmm. has a plan for you. He wants to send you to the nations because the whole message was about mm -hmm. the 1040 window in the nations. Mm -hmm. And I started thinking about, man, the world's ending and the Netflix documentaries I've been watching for months. And I even had another experience a few months before I didn't share where a voice told me to jump off a balcony. Literally a demon tried to tell me to kill myself and I was never suicidal. And I literally almost jumped off a balcony. I literally stood over a balcony, 13 stories high, several months before I was at the service mm -hmm. and almost took my life. Mm -hmm. The demon told me to jump off and I almost did. And thank God, God intervened once again. So here I am now thinking about that, thinking about my life's been the same. I have mm -hmm. no value, no purpose, no direction. I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. I'm getting hired as my dream job. I have mm -hmm. a girl who I've been with four years. I'm going to marry. I have, I'm graduating high school at night. I mean, I'm graduating college at 19. Mm -hmm. I graduated high school at 16. I have everything going for me, but I'm empty. And so I felt in that moment when he started calling people, I felt something literally grab my shirt. And again, those of you that don't believe, you don't have to believe. I don't make any value, any money off you believing me. I felt something grab my shirt and start pulling me towards that altar. Now, in my words, then I didn't know no one comes to the father unless the spirit first draws. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. I just thought something feels like it's physically pulling me to the mm -hmm. altar. So I got out of my chair. I go forward as fast as I could to the altar. And I basically am there saying, I'm not going to say the sinner's prayer. I've said the sinner's prayer a million times growing mm -hmm. up. I got taught that if you just pray the sinner's prayer, you'll be saved. And I was like, well, I'm definitely not saved. So I'm not praying the sinner's prayer. And I just was very angry for whatever reason. Maybe I was, I don't know, manifesting. I don't know. I was angry. I was mad. And I basically said this. And if you're religious, just put your earplugs in for five seconds. I said, God, I don't effing believe in you. And I didn't know what else to say. That so, was while my you, so while you're being dragged to the altar or you're being pulled yeah. to the when altar, you're the saying altar. that? So, yeah. So right when I get to the altar, I'm standing at the altar. There's probably uh -huh. three to 400 people around me. And I'm saying this to my, basically, I don't know, under my breath out mm -hmm. loud, I'm just saying this to God. This is my conversation. If, there, if there's any God out there, mm -hmm. I said, and this is so dumb. Think about this. God, I don't effing believe in you. It's like, well, you're acknowledging there's a God because you're trying to talk to him. But mm -hmm. of course, deep down, I wanted there to be a God. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to be an atheist. I wanted there to be mm -hmm. something more and said, I don't believe in you. And then I said something so crazy. I said, but if you're real, and I just, for whatever reason, started saying, I'll give you everything. I'll move out of state. I'll travel the world, which is so weird to say that. Why would an atheist say that? I'll break up with my girlfriend. I'll leave my job in law enforcement. I'm just basically, Vlad, saying the most radical things possible for someone to respond. 
for wow. someone, someone out there, tell me I'm here for a reason. Someone out there, mm. tell me I'm hurting. I wanted someone to say, Isaiah, you're hurting and I can change you wow. and I have a plan for you. And so I said, but if you're real, I don't believe in you, but if you're real, mm -hmm. I'll give you everything. And I'm saying this to God and I'm like, I'm not praying this in his prayer. As I'm saying all this and in my, in my deep, deep heart of heart, Vlad's, I meant it. I, mm -hmm. I really meant it. I really meant God will give you everything. I hear an audible voice, okay? An audible voice, mm -hmm. not inward, not a whisper, not, I was not full of the Holy Spirit at all. I was literally full of demons. Mm -hmm. I hear an audible voice say Isaiah. And guys, when the God of the universe, 7 mm -hmm. billion people says your name, mm -hmm. like, God, you know my first, you know my name? You, you thought about me before? You have a, like, it, it blew wow. my mind. Wow. I'm hearing this audible voice. And this is what the voice said. Isaiah, I don't want 99.9% .9 of you. So here you have a God, not like the God I learned about, where it's like, just pray the prayer, do whatever you want. He doesn't really mm. care. Just come. No, this God is demanding everything of me. He's telling me, I don't want 99.9%. .9%. I don't want part of you. He said, but if you give me everything, I'll use you. And then I had like, wow. I don't know if it's an out-of-body experience, in the body, out of the body. I'm seeing bright lights. I'm having visions. I'm in this other place. I'm no longer at that service. Mm -hmm. And God is telling me he's going to use me to preach the gospel. I'm seeing myself on stages with mm -hmm. thousands of people around. And I'm seeing weirdly myself in North Korea, which North Korea is completely a closed nation. Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing no revival happening in North Korea, which is so weird, weird and so That's bizarre crazy. to me. And God is telling me, I'll use you. And then my response to God was, I have nothing to offer you. Wow. So God says, I don't want 99. And I tell God, I'm an, I have nothing to offer you. I was an atheist one second ago. Mm -hmm. And God said, Isaiah, I'll take your hands. I'll take your feet. I'll take your mouth. I'll take your lips. Mm -hmm. I didn't know Romans chapter 12 says to give our body parts to mm -hmm. God on the altar of living sacrifice. God actually wants us to give our body to him. Mm -hmm. And so he said, I'll, I'll use you to preach my gospel. And I was like crying. So now I'm crying for the first time in literally a decade. Dirt is coming out of my eyes. And I know people are like, I don't believe you. And it, again, it's cool. You don't have to believe me. This is my story, my testimony. You don't need to believe it. But literal dirt's coming out of my eyes. So I'm rubbing my eyes because I'm crying. Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing like dirt, like it's like almost like mud, but dirt in my hands and my eyes. I'm just rubbing. I can't stop mm -hmm. crying, rubbing. And then I start speaking in tongues, which I, I want to be very clear on this. I have heard tongues up until this point. Uh -huh. One time. In my entire life, wow. at probably the age of five years old, I have a vivid memory of being five or six and my parents praying in tongues one time in my entire life. So my church didn't speak in tongues. I've never heard tongues before, wow. ever in church that I could ever remember. So now I didn't, I, remember, I didn't, I'm not asking for this. I'm not uh -huh. saying I want to speak in tongues. I'm speaking now in this language that I've never heard before, except one time that I didn't even at the time, of course, didn't remember at five. It was later that I remember that mm -hmm. my girlfriend's now next to me. I'm crying. I'm seeing bright lights. I'm seeing myself preaching to people. Mm -hmm. I'm saying, God, I have nothing to offer you. God's saying, give me your hands, give me your feet. And then I'm saying, I'm speaking in tongues. And then in my, as I'm speaking in tongues, I'm having this back and forth with God. And I say, okay, God, what do you want me to do? Mm -hmm. What, like, how could this happen? What do you want me to do? And this is what he said, pray one hour a day. And then as he's saying that, so mind you, mm -hmm. I'm in my head talking to God, speaking in mm -hmm. tongues. He says, pray one hour a day. The pastor's on stage and the pastor said, there's a young man in this room. There's three to 400 people at the mm -hmm. altar, huge mega church. Mm -hmm. He says, there's a young man in this room right now. And God says, I've removed the dirty scales off your eyes. Wow. Cause I didn't know anything about dirty scales. Uh -huh. None of that. I didn't know. I just was like, something's happening to my eyeballs. Uh -huh. He said, God said he's removing the dirty scales. And God is saying, he wants you to pray one hour a day. And this is wow. right after in my mind, I'm hearing the audible voice of God say to pray an hour a day. So this is all happening. It's all confirmation. I thought it was like a couple minutes. It was probably 45 minutes to an hour. I'm at the altar, but it feels like, you know, encounters, wow. you don't know time. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. it's like what? And it felt like a minute I come to, and I'm just like, Vlad, I, I kid you not. This is no exaggeration. I didn't recognize anything. I didn't recognize anyone. The colors looked different. It was like when I looked at the color of the walls, mm -hmm. it was like the first time I ever saw a color. It was like when I looked at people and my sister came up wow. to me and was like, are you okay? And I'm like, I don't know what just happened. I need to go home. Everyone's 
I don't recognize nobody. I don't recognize nothing. I'm like this newborn baby that just got dropped oh, into wow. a church service and is like, what is going on? And so I said, I need to go home. Something happened. What do you mean? Something happened. So we get in the car. We drive home. I'm up all night long, Vlad, all night long. I didn't sleep a minute, okay? And I'm just talking to God, praying. I'm throwing out my Xbox, throwing out my video games, throwing out my movies, deleting everything. I'm on a rampage, getting rid of everything. And here's why. Before anyone says anything, I want you guys to notice something. I'm doing all of that because I'm thinking, whatever just happened to me, I don't ever want it to end. Mm. Whatever just happened to me, I don't ever want it to leave. And so I automatically connected this holy experience, because that's what happens when the Holy Ghost mm -hmm. comes upon you. You feel unholy. And mm -hmm. I felt extremely unholy at that altar. And I realized I had no conviction of cussing, Vlad. Wow. Every other word was the F word. No exaggeration. Mm -hmm. My unsafe friends were like, dude, you are dark. And now those are people that weren't even Christians. Every As I got that encounter with the it's Holy crazy. Spirit and I was born again, mm -hmm. I put my faith in Jesus. I looked at what he did on the cross. I mm -hmm. accepted his <clears throat> salvation work of the cross. I repented truly of my sins. Mm -hmm. That moment at the altar, I felt so unclean as God began to wash me. Mm -hmm. I realized the, the misery of my sin and the, the worthlessness of everything I'd been doing. And I felt instant conviction. The drinking was wrong. The cussing was wow. wrong. The smoking was wrong. The pornography was wrong. The sleeping with my girlfriend was wrong. The video games were wrong. Everything I felt instantly. So when I went home, I started purging everything, anything in my life that could stop Whatever this is, let's just and I'm pause, trying not to just, use religious let's words. Let's just pause for just a second. Yeah, yeah. This was this is crazy. So you're you're a young guy, you are in metal band, you're involved in in drinking, and involved in drugs with your girlfriend. You haven't been in church for three years. You pretty no. much are almost like a practicing atheist, but you're hurting, you haven't seen the power of God. Here's your sister praying for you inviting you to church you're coming to a youth group on Wednesday night so this is not like a revival service a youth group and the youth pastor is preaching about missions out of all sermons he's yep. preaching on missions you've been watching some Netflix documentaries so you're you kind of been you know curious about the whole world coming to an end and everything and then just a few months before that you almost took your own life because something yep. just pushed you and there you are being feeling like you're being pulled to the altar Inside of your head, you're cursing, but also making these bargains with God if He's real or not. And God just supernaturally encounters you. He begins to, I mean, He saw your hunger. He did see that you were hungry for Him. It just, yep. you probably didn't know how to verbalize it properly. And you hear God's audible voice. You start seeing a vision of your future. And right there and then, without being, without any suggestion, without nobody nope. praying for you, you start speaking in other tongues. You're experiencing this like mud coming out of your eyes and and this youth pastor begins to give you uh begins to give this word that somebody is there god is washing you you need to pray for an hour a day and pretty much right there and then not like six four uh days later but right there and then radical transformation happens isaiah goes from being dead to being alive from darkness to light and then your convictions you begin to feel again you begin to cry again you begin to get convictions again you begin to feel um, not comfortable with things that you were completely comfortable with before because none of these things you were not stranger to Christian values this was no. not something that you were just completely like ab absolutely oblivious to Christian morals you grew up in a Christian household and then you go home and you go on this crazy crusade of house cleaning house yep. cleansing yeah so I start getting rid of everything everything that is remember I remember I don't want 99.9% .9 of you so in my uh -huh. mind I was like, I got to give him everything. God, anything you want, I'll give you. And so I just thought, hey, look at all this stuff is unholy in my life. I'm getting rid of everything unholy out of my life. And from that day, Vlad, from that moment, mm -hmm. 13 years later, never cussed again, not even slipped up, never drank again, never gone back to pornography. Some people say, were you truly repenting, brother? Did you put your faith in the cross? Friend, I was born again. I went from death to life transfer wow. from the kingdom of darkness to light didn't sleep so i'm up all night mm -hmm. getting rid of everything everyone's like what is going on i'm driving my car to college the next day i had college class in mm -hmm. the morning and i remember pulling over on the side of the freeway and i'm just bawling like a baby i'm looking wow. at the sun vlad i kid you not it was like i've never seen the sun before i mean a butterfly would go by and i, I break out crying because i'm like everything's new it was like i went from 360p to 4k it was Everything wow. was life and clear and joy and peace. And I'm getting up with purpose and I'm excited. So I'm at school now. I get to my college campus. 
Mind you, I'm a straight A student. I think I got one B in college. I'm at the front of my class, every class. I never miss. I'm five minutes early to every class and I'm at school and I'm seeing. So here, here I am. Mm -hmm. I get saved that night. I'm up all night. I get to college. I'm seeing demons and angels, literally like open eye, not like visions out of body. I'm seeing demons and angels going around over people's heads, fighting. I'm seeing demons over people. I'm sitting in class. I'm hearing the thoughts of the guy next to me, which I didn't know was like a word of knowledge gift. I didn't know what was going on. And I'm just like, what is happening? I told my teacher, I said, wow. I have to go. I'm sorry. I've never left class early, but I'm something's going on with me. I don't know what is happening. I legitimately thought I was like, am I a psychic? Like what is happening? I, Cause I didn't know about the gifts of the Holy spirit. Uh -huh. I didn't know first Corinthians 12 mm -hmm. talks about words of knowledge, prophecy, wisdom. So I'm having this experience. I'm in my car crying, not crying. Like, God just wrecked my life mm -hmm. in the best way possible. I get home, I'm telling my parents and they start calling my uncle who's been in ministry for 30 plus years and he's in New York and they say, you need to get home right now. Is that, is that Pastor Isaiah. Nico? Is that Pastor Nico? Nino, yeah, that's Nino. Uh, Nino. Uh -huh. Yeah, they, they said something happened to Isaiah, you need to get home. He's not sleeping, he's not eating. He's, he's seeing demons and angels. He's telling people their future. He's, he's hearing people's thoughts and Three days, I didn't sleep. I'm up for three full days. My uncle gets home and I literally 18 to 20 hours straight begin to tell him everything God was showing me, everything God was doing. I told him, Nino, there's going to be a revival in our house. Thousands of people are going to come to our house. Our friends are going to get saved. Our family's all going to get saved. There's going to be a revival. And he's like, who, who where'd you hear, hear the word revival? I was like, God. And Vlad, I'm not reading books. Mm -hmm. I'm not looking at literature. God is downloading onto me what he's going to do in my family and with my friends. Mm -hmm. And if some of you are like, that's impossible, you've never read the Bible. If you think what I'm saying tonight is impossible, you don't know the God that we serve. And I want someone, as mm -hmm. they're listening, I believe this prophetically, I want you to start believing for the impossible again. Mm -hmm. I want Come you on. to start believing for the illogical. Mm -hmm. Why are our prayers so rational and logical? Come on. I want you right now, begin to pray, say, Lord, do something in my life like mm -hmm. this. Yeah. God, I want to see my family saved. I want to mm -hmm. see my friends saved. I want to see my kids saved. I want the power of the Holy Ghost. Why have we, why have we dumbed God down to a mm -hmm. 90 minute on Sunday? Yeah. You can see this in your life. And so, you know, and, and the Bible now, says, Isaiah, you know, that you must be born again to see the kingdom. And a lot yes. of times what happens is that we're born again, and but we don't see anything. You know, we don't, on. we don't access anything. We don't walk in, we don't enter into anything. It's almost like, we, we just got a spare tire. We got an insurance card instead of actually entering into a total different realm. And for you, you literally went from darkness into light. You literally went from death into life. You entered into a total different realm. No Bible school, uh, no courses on how to nope. see in the Spirit or how to hear Holy Spirit or how to see visions and dreams and none of that stuff. You pretty much got thrown into it, started to drink from the fire hose and then you actually started to go into, not only you introduced it to your uncle who's your pastor, but you started to go into these also eight hours straight prayers. Yes, yeah. So my uncle said, okay, so here I am 18, 20 hours talking to my uncle nonstop, won't mm -hmm. stop. And he said, okay, what are we going to do? He's like overwhelmed. He's like, you're telling me the end times and the world and family. What's the, th and I said, we're going to pray at our house and God's going to bring people to our house. So we started praying and I kid you not, we had pretty much a 24 hour prayer meeting going on for weeks at a time where we didn't know what else to do. In my mind, I thought, okay, we are partying, drinking. I was throwing these big parties mm -hmm. and we were partying, drinking. Now we're saved. I didn't have like a religious person tell me, oh, you don't need to pray that much. Oh, you don't need to fast that much. Oh, you don't need to give up everything. I just knew. God said, give everything up. I mm -hmm. gave everything up. I started praying. We all started praying just three, four, five of us, my little sister, my uncle, me, my cousin, and a couple other people. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, revival begin to happen. People begin to show up. And when I say people begin to show up, Vlad, this uh -huh. is all on record. I have videos of this. It's all in my journal mm -hmm. as well. I'm talking about people would show up to my house and mm -hmm. say, I don't know what's going on here. A voice told me to come here. I saw a bunch of cars outside. I heard loud music. And I'm on, I'm in the country on this property with, you know, five acres, a large house, a big driveway. And people are randomly showing up saying, I heard there's a revival going on. I heard some young man encounter the Holy Spirit and words starting to get around a town. We have about 70,000 people in our town. Words getting around. My friends I was drinking with five days ago 
are now at my house praying. The guy I'm with, my partner in my beer punk tournament mm -hmm. 15 days ago is now next to me. We're casting out demons together. And God began to, it, it felt like, wow. Vlad, I don't say this mm -hmm. facetiously. Mm -hmm. It felt like everybody got saved. Like all my family, all my friends, it just seemed like the revival was so special. Mm -hmm. No one can get away from this. Like if you were in the vicinity and you showed up, mm -hmm. you're getting saved because it was raw. Wow. It was real. I can't take credit for none of it. Mm -hmm. It was the Holy Spirit showing up at my house. Mm -hmm. I moved all the furniture out of my house. I said, mom and dad, we got to move everything out. These are souls. These are places people can be standing. So my house was literally completely empty. We moved all the furniture to the garage, the mm -hmm. detached garage. People would be outside looking in. We had four to five, within like three, two to three months, we had mm -hmm. four to 500 people coming to my house every single week. And these are not flyers, Facebook, mm -hmm. YouTube, none of that. It was just Word of mouth. Mm -hmm. People were getting healed. My aunt, who was born deaf in one of her ears, who, mm -hmm. who's big time at the hospital out here, she got her hearing completely restored. My other cousin was deaf in one ear, got his hearing restored. We saw people getting out of wheelchairs. Deliverance started breaking out. People started manifesting. And then I remember one day Vlad telling my uncle, I looked at Mark, the book of Mark, and I said, wait, the disciples are casting out demons. Mm -hmm. They're healing the sick. They're raising the dead. And I said, can we do these things? And he said that in his mind, because he was involved in a mega church, 30 years of organized religion, he said in his mind, he knew he could either neuter me right there and say, no, we can't do none of that. Or say, Isaiah, everything in this book we have access to. Wow. Everything that God said in this book, we can do. And he told Come me that on. day, everything we can do. And so we started doing what was in the Bible. Come on. We didn't have this like, well, uh -huh. you know, brother, you need to go through four years of cemetery. I mean, seminary. <laughs> oh, yeah, brother, you need to go through this or that. Mm -hmm. We just knew the Bible. It was in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, my friends were getting saved. My family was getting saved. My brother, my sister, my parents, everybody was getting lit on fire. We had these basically prayer meetings that didn't end. We'd mm -hmm. go to work. My house was always open 24-7. Our friends that were round table, in and out, Starbucks, that we were all working, 19, 20 years old, they would just get off work. Some of my friends were EMTs. Some of them were police officers. Mm -hmm. They would get off work, come straight to my house, pray, fall asleep, wake up. And mm -hmm. these are not church people. Wow. This is what I want everyone to get. Mm -hmm. These are not church people. That's these crazy. are people that were partying a week ago, two weeks ago, all of them freshly saved. And all they know is the fire of God. Wow. All they know is 24 hour prayer meetings. All they know is you hear God. Like mm -hmm. we just, we literally would just believe lad, like, oh, mm -hmm. you get saved. And you can hear the voice of God. God mm -hmm. can speak to you. His sheep know his, hear his voice. That's mm -hmm. what makes them his sheep. Mm -hmm. And so we were just hearing God, praying, doing deliverance. It wasn't abnormal. It mm -hmm. wasn't like, wait, you guys are doing deliverance every day at your house. Wait, you guys are praying for the sick. People are getting out of wheelchairs. We just thought, oh, this is how every Christian is. This is in the Bible. And it was that organic and genuine can you move speak, of God that broke out of my living can room. Can you speak a little bit into uh, Pastor Greg's conference? You mentioned how before this revival broke out, you actually had to prepare the house and how God actually led you to cleanse the house, not only to remove the furniture, but you were actually getting rid of all the other stuff including stuff in your sister's room and some other things and you felt like you need to get the house ready before revival will come and you the way you preached is that hey this is gonna this preparation it's not legalism but it's about preparing yourself for revival can you speak a little bit about some of the preparation that you had to do some of the cleaning that you had to do yeah so god basically said isaiah i want to show up at your house i want to have revival i want to move my holy spirit wants to move but I can't this and this, and I want to say a preface by saying this. Mm -hmm. This is what God told me. This was my personal testimony and experience. So you might say, well, where is that in the Bible, brother? That seems a little dramatic or legalistic. A lot of you don't have what I'm talking about because you won't give up what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And there's a, like a, a saying my brother used to have in one of his rap songs. I have what you don't because I gave up what you won't. And a lot of people... They want this radical move of God. And then God says, do something radical, but they don't do it. Now, this is what Vlad, God told me to do. I'm not saying everybody needs to do this. I'm saying God told me, he said, Isaiah, I need you to remove out everything unholy in your house. There's things unholy. So I started getting rid of every movie, all the music, every TV, everything I can think of that was unholy. And so mm -hmm. one day I went back to prayer. I said, okay, Lord, it's time now for revival. Everything unholy has been removed. I've cleansed my house. And my and the Lord said, there's two more things in your house that are unholy. He said, this is what he told me. My brother wasn't saved at the time. He, mm -hmm. got, a, he got saved about a month after me. He said, your brother has Blu-ray DVDs. He's hiding them under so, his hamper. So God, told, God told you that. God told me this. And remember, okay. this is my testimony. So uh -huh. before you're like, where's that in the Bible? This is my testimony. 
He said, there's Blu-ray Harry Potter DVDs under your brother's hamper of dirty clothes. He's hiding. Now, why would my brother be hiding that? Because my brother saw me on a rampage getting rid of everything. Of I had no discrimination. I'm going up in your room. And guys, I was unhinged. I was just so radical for this thing. I And then he said, and your little sister, which we just told this story on the, when I had her on the podcast, uh -uh. your little sister has a bottle of alcohol in her closet. She's been hiding it. Now, mind you, my little sister doesn't drink. She doesn't drink. So she's the one that brought me to church. And I'm like, there's no way that that's possible. But I obeyed the voice of God. So I bust in my brother's room and he's already mad. He's like, get out of my room, you freak. What do you want? Because he was, he was mad because me and him used to party every day together. And now I'm this Jesus freak. I'm uh -huh. this, you know, Bible slinging, casting out demons. And he didn't like what was happening at our house. Mm -hmm. And he was about to move, literally was moving that week to go start a drug house in San Francisco. So wow. it's a whole nother story with my brother. Uh -huh. Maybe if we have time, I'll share. But I said, there's something in here. And God told me we need to remove it so we can have revival and the Holy Spirit can show up. He said, no, there's not. I said, yes, there is. And I went to his dirty hamper. Mind you, you know, this is a college age man whose mm -hmm. the hamper was not, did not smell well. And I started throwing out all of his dirty clothes, looking for what I knew God showed me was there. Mm -hmm. And I found that brand new Blu-ray, Harry Potter, whatever Blu-ray he had just bought. And I pick it up. He's screaming at me put that down, put that down. I remember running out of the house. He's chasing me out of the house or running in circles. We had a mm -hmm. big property. He's running around. I said, Nico, we have to get rid of this. I have to get rid of this because the Holy spirit wants to move. And so I ended up finally trashing it, convincing mm -hmm. him to let me trash it. I threw that away. Mm -hmm. All right, Lord. And the Lord said, last thing is your sister's room. So I go into my sister's room. I said, Hey, cherish, is there anything in here that like would be bad or would prevent the Holy spirit from showing up anything unholy? And she's like, no, what are you talking about? And I'm like, Hmm. Is there any alcohol in here? And she's like, she turns white as a ghost. She's like, how did you know? What do you, we wow. both go, we both beeline to her closet and we start looking through her closet. And she said, my boss, she worked at a Mexican restaurant. Mm -hmm. My boss gave me this as like a employee of the month type of gift, a very expensive, bo expensive bottle of tequila. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to throw it away because it's very expensive. So I hid it in my closet a while ago. I forgot about it. And I cannot believe you just reminded me that that was there. We dumped that down the drain. I went back in prayer and the Lord said, okay, Isaiah, everything unholy is out of your house. The movies, the music, the games, the culture, the witchcraft, the drink, mm -hmm. the alcohol, all of the poison is out of your house. Now my presence can show up. And it was right after that moment where wow. the presence of God would begin to show up. People said they would turn the corner and my house was a mile down the corner. Like mm -hmm. when you turn the corner, it was about a mile down that road. Mm -hmm. They said they would turn the corner and start shaking in the presence of God and wow. filling his presence. Now I want to say this. Some of you might be listening saying, brother, that's legalism. The Bible doesn't say to do that. Remember when David, Vlad, lost the presence of God? The Bible says when David got the ark of God back, mm -hmm. every six steps, mm -hmm. they would sacrifice. They would sacrifice. Six mm -hmm. steps, mm -hmm. they would sacrifice. And here's why. It wasn't in the Bible. God never told David to do it. Mm -hmm. It was nowhere in the law. But David said, I've lost the presence of God. Mm -hmm. I'll never lose it again. And I'm going to sacrifice mm. like crazy. I'm going to do something that God didn't even ask me to do to make mm. sure I never lose his presence. So there are moments where you need to do stuff radical. Mm -hmm. And it sounds, I know you're like listening. Oh, Isaiah, he's so crazy. Absolutely. I lost my mind, got the mind of Christ. Mm -hmm. You couldn't tell me anything otherwise. And then Vlad, not only did, was I doing all these crazy things, but I was seeing fruit. I was seeing my family saved. I was seeing my mm. brother saved. I was seeing my sister saved. I was seeing my parents get reunited and get lit on fire. My mm -hmm. cousins get saved. My mm -hmm. aunts and uncles get saved. Like I was seeing the fruit wow. of sacrificing. Mm -hmm. So it might sound weird or uh -huh. crazy to some of you How listening, you, but this is what God told when, me to do. When was your deliverance? Because you also, I know that there was a time that you had, was it around this time or was it when the revival already happened? Or is it before yeah, so revival got, that you I got delivered the right before the revival broke out. It okay. was a couple days after getting saved. I would be sharing my faith and I would feel something like wanting to come out of my throat, like a scratchy or like uh -huh. wanting to cough. And I knew there was something there. I'm like, something's in me. I don't know hmm. what this is. I was getting super weird, random, bizarre, demented thoughts that mm -hmm. I knew. I'm like, these thoughts are not my thoughts. Mm. I've never, even when I was in the world, I never had these thoughts. Wow. These are not my thoughts. There has to be something there. And then, of course, I'm reading the Bible. I'm like, oh, there's demons. Okay, there must be a demon in me wanting to come out of me. So I mm -hmm. actually tried doing self-deliverance in the parking lot of my college. I was in my car because this thing was like trying to come out of me. Mm -hmm. It didn't want to be in me. And I couldn't get this thing out. So I go home and I tell my little sister, you're going to do deliverance on me. Because, again, I didn't have, I didn't know who else would do it. It was just me and my little sister and my uncle. Uh -huh. And she's like, what? I said, yeah, you're going to cast all these demons out of me. And these were 
spirits of shame, uh -huh. of perversion, of lust. Now, mind you, I had this thing that I, I haven't shared yet where I can never look anyone in the eye. I never really? could make eye contact. And even in college, my uh -huh. professors who were sergeants and lieutenants, because I have a degree in administration of justice, uh -huh. they would say, Saldivar, look me in the eye. And I couldn't look people in the eye. I didn't take pictures. I didn't make eye contact ever. Wow. If I was talking to you, Vlad, I'd be looking at your ear or I'd be looking to the side or looking down. Hmm. Now, I want to I want to emphasize this, Vlad. Mm -hmm. I didn't know why I was like that. It wasn't like I wanted to be. I just mm -hmm. didn't know for some some reason I can't look at people in the eye. There's something mm -hmm. wrong with me. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't know it was a demon. I just thought something's wrong with me. So there we were in my living room. My little sister cast all of these demons. They started screaming out of me, speaking out of me, shame, um, guilt, lust, perversion. All of these demons came out of me. And I'll never forget, after she did that deliverance on me, I ran to my bathroom and looked in the mirror. And I did. I looked in the mirror and I saw a different person. I had the wow. physical dark countenance, like mm -hmm. the dark circles. Mm -hmm. They were completely gone. I was for the first time in my life able to make eye contact with people wow. all that shame all uh -huh. that guilt i was like i could take pictures it wouldn't like that's so crazy i couldn't take pictures before i didn't know why i hated wow. pictures even this is another weird thing that's that crazy. some of you might not realize i even loved darkness i would take showers in the dark i uh -huh. didn't have the lights on uh -huh. i would get ready in the dark my mom would always say turn the light <laughs> on turn the light on that was her famous saying because my room was always dark I would shower in the dark. I would brush my teeth in the dark. I hated the light. Like when mm. I say I hated the light, I don't mean the light of God. I meant physical light. I never wanted to be in the light. It was so weird how I became this isolated vampire-ish type of person and not knowing why. Wow. I was like, I don't know why I hate the light, but it huh. was that it was those demons in me that just made me dark. They made me just weird. And then once I got delivered, of course, that's not the case anymore. Mm -hmm. I got fully freedom. So maybe some of you watching are like, I don't know why I can't make eye contact. I don't know why mm. I'm having weird face gyrations or I'm having a dark countenance or I'm like you or some of you watching, you hate showering. You hate being hygienic and you're like, mm. why is my hygiene bad? Remember, these are unclean spirits. Mm -hmm. These unclean spirits will at times make you also be unclean, mm -hmm. make you also love darkness. Mm -hmm. And a spirit of shame, I realized why I didn't want to make eye contact. I was ashamed. Mm -hmm. I was ashamed of my secret life I was living. Mm -hmm. And once that spirit came out, praise the Lord, I was free wow. from that. That's so crazy. But honestly, I know like, I talk <laughs> long, man. I'm so long-winded on these. You are, um, you are incredible, Isaiah. I appreciate you being vulnerable and sharing your story. And also, honestly, kudos to your parents. I'm thinking, as you're sharing, I'm thinking like if... If I would be the parent to be able to see this, I mean, almost, almost at first, it seems like this loose cannon. This oh, just they were, much... they were kind of like worried. They told my uncle, like, this guy, we take him out in public and he's trying to prophesy over <laughs> everyone. The animals weren't even like, I was trying to prophesy over our dog. I was, I was literally just wild. And the and fact parents, that they let they you, they didn't know what was going on. The fact that they let you open your, your, their house and host the revival and stuff. So, and your parents are in the chat and, your uncle is in the chat and so we we just honor them as well because yes. they're the ones that honestly allowed for your craziness to, to not to shut it down and not to come in and say you know what Isaiah this is too much you know hey don't be so super, super radical because you know a lot of us when we see somebody who was but you have to understand is Isaiah was super radical yes. before so and now when he encountered Jesus it's kind of like Apostle Paul you know he couldn't do mediocre he was either radical one way or he was radical the other way. Apostle Paul just went straight into preaching, confronting people who didn't know Jesus and encouraging them to encounter Christ. I remember uh, you told me a story of when you were casting out a demon, <laughs> you were sitting on the prison trying to choke, not choke them, but command yeah, the but... demon to come out. And then your mom kind of came to you because you were doing it pretty much all night. Yeah, we were, we were, we didn't know what to do. We were learning. So we were uh -huh. like, we thought the demons were literally in the person. We were like, we got to get these demons literally out. So we made a lot of mistakes being new, not knowing. Mm -hmm. And then one time we were doing deliverance. My mom is a police officer. And so she had to wake up really early in the morning. And we were like two in the morning. Actually, this was a different situation. Casting a demon out of a friend of ours had a spirit of suicide. And we're screaming. And my mom's like, Isaiah yelling at me uh -huh. from across the house. And I thought, I thought in my mind, blood, I'm in trouble. It's uh -huh. two in the morning. My mom has to wake up at like 5 a.m. I'm screaming, casting no demons. But this is how normal it was. Screaming in my living room. And my mom's like, Isaiah. I'm like, sorry, mom, what? And she's like, 
you need to use the name of Jesus more. And I'm like, oh, thanks, mom. But it was like so radical and normal that deliverances were happening every day in our house. Because remember, mm -hmm. these were not church people. These were all my party friends. Mm -hmm. I, I had a lot of friends in the world. And these were all my party friends from when I was in a band, mm -hmm. from college, from just being, you know, mm -hmm. I, I was just well known from being in a band. Mm -hmm. They were the ones coming. Mm -hmm. So they had a lot of critters on board. They yeah. needed a lot of deliverance. It uh -huh. wasn't like a, a church friend coming. Uh -huh. A lot of my friends never been to church. Mm -hmm. A lot of them didn't even know who Jesus was. They're mm -hmm. like, who's Jesus, you know? So they were coming and getting deliverance. And this was every day we were having deliverances. We were having praying for people. It was 24 seven, Vlad. It literally was, you could ask anyone that was there. Anytime you came to my house, somebody was praying and somebody was crying out to God doing deliverance. And, and shortly we had some that, days where deliverances in each room of the house. It was crazy. Shortly after that, you actually started to preach in, in other places. In fact, was it a month after your conversion that you were on the same stage with Rayhard Bonke and you had no idea who that person was? Yeah, so it wasn't a month. So the revival broke out of the house. I'm uh -huh. sharing my testimony. The house would get so packed, Vlad. Uh -huh. I kid you not, there's a video of this on YouTube. People would be sitting on my feet because there was no room. Everyone, the floor, floor was covered. We removed all the chairs. It was just people on people packed out. And mm -hmm. I'd be standing still, literally still like this with a microphone. And people would be saying like, why are you using a microphone? And then we'd pan the camera and see a packed house, people outside, people in the kitchen, people mm -hmm. in the third living room, people down the hallway. I mean, people were literally hundreds outside listening through the window, looking through the windows. Mm -hmm. And this is, again, I have videos of this and pictures you can find mm -hmm. on my social media. I'd be preaching with people sitting on my feet. And then someone from Morningstar, which was Rick Joyner's ministry, found mm -hmm. out about it and mm -hmm. came down and did like a worship song at our house. This was probably seven or eight months, nine months, maybe in oh, okay. and went back and told Rick Joyner. There's this revival at this house I've never seen. She's like, I've been all over the world. I've been in crusades. I've never in my life seen anything like this. She mm -hmm. cried the whole time she was at our house. Wow. She told Rick Joyner, you need to get this guy. Now, I didn't know. I had like shared my testimony at local conferences and the local churches, but I didn't know about nothing. I've never been on a plane. I didn't know any pastors like that level. I just knew God was going to use me and I was being mm -hmm. obedient to God. And I literally just made the pulpit in my living room. I didn't wait for an invite. I'm mm -hmm. like, my living room will be my pulpit. So mm -hmm. come on, that's Rick a word Joyner for somebody. Contacts us. Uh -huh. Rick Joyner contacts us and says, we have this conference, Reinhard Bonnke, Bob Jones, him and another guy. And we want you to come speak. And I'm like, okay, I, I, I didn't know who Reinhard Bonnke was. I didn't know who Rick Joyner, Bob Jones, none of these guys were. And so they said, we'll fly you out. I've never been on a plane. My uncle traveled for like 20 something years all over the US for his job. So he knew all about mm -hmm. the ins and outs of airports. I didn't know anything. I've never been on an airplane. Wow. So we fly out there. We get to it. It's a massive building, five story. It's like a hotel atrium. It was uh, mm -hmm. Jim Baker's old building, the old PTL building. And I'm in this massive building, huge auditorium, several thousand seats. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be on God TV, 40 million viewers total. And I'm like, I'm speaking Friday night, Reinhard Bonnke speaking Saturday night. I still have this picture of the seats to sit down. It said mm -hmm. Isaiah Saldivar and then Reinhard Bonnke next to each other. I'm, you know, they put the little name on your seat. Mm -hmm. I have a picture of that still. And I, I didn't know who Reinhard Bonnke was. I get to my hotel room, which is in the actual building. It's a mm -hmm. huge hotel. And I look up who Reinhard Bonnke is. I'm saved like a year. Vlad, I didn't even know the names of all the 12 disciples yet by heart. I was like, didn't know hardly anything. And I'm looking him up. And I see 7 million in Africa, 5 million in Africa, 60 million plus saved. And I'm wow. like, this guy is a legend. So when I met Reinhard Bonnke uh -huh. that night, that was the first time I ever had, like, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have this, like, these guys are superstars. Uh -huh. I just knew, Hey, God touched my life. And mm. so I told my uncle, I'm like, what should I do? Cause I was thousands of people. It's five mm -hmm. stories. It was just overwhelming cameras. Here I am from a living room. I'm mm -hmm. like, dude, I'm in, I'm preaching in a living room. What put am I nerve, doing here? Put, put it in nerve wracking. And, it, it was nerve wracking. And this is why my uncle said, he said, Isaiah, be yourself. And mm. they will recognize that God is with you, that God's presence is on you. Mm. And I got up there and I preached and I preached my heart out. I shared my testimony. I talked about being radical for God. No more of this Sunday morning only. We got to go all in. Halfway through the service, people were running to the altar, crying, repenting, turning wow. to God. We didn't get out of that building, Vlad, until and out of that service back to our hotel room till about two o'clock in the morning. We stood there and prayed for uh -huh. every single person. We saw miracles. We saw the power of God. And that, that, that was one time where one guy told me that this will be your, I, for lack of a better term, coming out of the closet. And from wow. that day on, really? Vlad, I kid you not, I was fully booked for the last 13 years. From that wow. one event, really? I've been fully booked. I've never promoted myself, never invited myself. I traveled for 10 years, 100 plus thousand miles a year in the U.S., mm -hmm. preaching over 500 churches just from that one breakout mm -hmm. thing. 
Um, then that's the revival a, went from the house uh -huh. into. Go ahead, sorry. To, to, uh, but it's such a. I just want to interrupt. It's such a good example for everybody there that's watching, and maybe you're a pastor or a leader, and you have this vision from God, like Isaiah shared, when it was. It wasn't something that he had of an ambition. Hey, I want to be famous. I want to preach everywhere. But it was a vision that God gave him at the altar. When he encountered yes. God, he gave him a vision that he will be preaching all around the world. And Isaiah wasn't trying to promote himself, pull himself up by his own, um, you know, by his own strength. He just simply went, start reaching his friends, start reaching his family members, turned his house into a revival center. And then eventually that grew into going into a building. And then he got under a pastor. He brought his uncle, you know, and came under that because somebody like him, it's very easy when you get radical to become also arrogant and to become yes. like, hey, I'm super passionate. You know, you can't tell me what to do. You can't steer me. You can't guide me. And of course, you were very fortunate to have a pastor who was who knew how to steer you instead of just constantly extinguishing your flame. Yes. And then God just opens this door where you go to this event that pretty much give, gives like a tipping point to your ministry nationally and internationally. And after that, you pretty much, you know, you become a household name where people now know you, people invite you um, and all of that. And then God starts to use you in a very, very powerful way. Did you always speak like this? Yes. Okay. So for those of you that are like, why do you talk so fast and loud? Vlad, I speak half the speed one third the speed of how I used to talk. Oh, really? I always, I always was super okay. loud. I spoke super fast, never used notes. You know, I've used notes maybe three times in 13 years. I would just, it was how I was, it mm -hmm. was how God br brought me up. And I feel like my uncle tells me this generation, they think fast, they talk fast. Mm -hmm. They're, they have three apps open at once. They're scrolling on TikTok while working, while writing this, while mm -hmm. watching a Netflix movie. And he said, I, he, this is what he would tell me. Okay. God has raised you up. Mm -hmm. to reach this generation they think fast they talk mm. fast they're fast paced so that's how i always was and i thank god for him and like you said he poured into me mm -hmm. he didn't extinguish my fire for 13 years he's covered me he's been a voice of reason he co-pastored with me and helped mm -hmm. me do so much stuff and without a seasoned man of god in my life i i i say this say that with say like that. all seriousness i would not be here right now mm -hmm. without my uncle without nino in my life i would not be serving god he was there not only helping me theologically mm -hmm. and saying, hey, this is what you should say, this is what you shouldn't say. Mm -hmm. Theologically, this isn't right. Theologically, not only just theologically, but accountability-wise, yes. with my marriage, with my family, mm -hmm. with my finances, um, all of that. I mean, mm -hmm. fully accountable in every realm. So I know, without and, him and, being and there and for a long time, me, he was actually the one, because when I invited you first time, I was actually dealing with your uncle. Yes. Oh yeah, yeah he did. Yeah, he for did my your whole trips. Mm -hmm. My whole traveling ministry for for ten years that I mm -hmm. I still travel about once a month, but I don't travel the way I used to. For mm -hmm. ten years, I full time traveled and pastored. He was not only co pastoring the church; he was traveling with me. He was booking all my hotels, mm -hmm. booking all my flights. And I'm telling you right now, I cannot give him enough flowers. He has never taken one dollar. Wow. from any ministry any church any of my events he's not made one dollar in 13 years being with me he for free because he retired early mm -hmm. he for free traveled with me covered me and did everything for me for free so for the last 13 years mm -hmm. selflessly and how does who does that wow. like vlad who gives 13 years of their life to mm -hmm. someone for free mm -hmm. with no strings attached to True say father. hey i want to make sure the plan god has for you comes mm -hmm. to pass True it, it was just a beautiful thing so this revival is happening in the church and it's on tuesday nights you're preaching there and then on sundays you're traveling and all around the nation and preaching um you're a young guy tell us about the story how you met Alyssa, your wife and hearing god how he spoke to you about her yeah so Alyssa, i when i got saved i was so I broke up with the girls with for those of you asking that was with for four years. God told me that's not your wife. Break up with her. I literally broke up with her via a text message, which everyone knows you don't do that. Yeah. But God told me to. God's like, if you meet up with her, you're going to stay with her. You need to break mm. up with her. So I broke up with my girlfriend. I talked to my basically the person that I was going to get hired through the lieutenant. Like, I'm not going to be doing law enforcement. I gave all everything up that wow. God told me to give up. And then about a month after the revival, maybe two months after Alyssa, who was also raised in church, but was not serving God whatsoever. Her friend was coming because her friend was like, there's a bunch of hot guys at this house having this revival. You need to come. And mind you, we were all young guys. They were all young girls. Everyone was in 19, 20, 21. And we weren't, I, I, I'm trying to say this the right way, but like we were popular in the world. So we weren't like 
nerdy or whatever. So people thought, oh, these guys are cool and they're like doing church. So we should try too. So she told Alyssa to come and Alyssa's came to the house and was like, this guy's crazy. Why is he yelling? Who is this guy? She just totally turned off. As she was leaving the house revival, one of our prayer team prayed for her and gave her a word of knowledge that totally made her cry and totally just removed all of her defenses. So the next wow. week she told her friend like, Hey, uh, are you going back to that house with all those people? I was, you know, cause she didn't want to tell her friend, like, I want to go back. God's doing something in my life. Mm -hmm. But she's like, are you going back? Her friend's like, yeah, I'm going back on Tuesday. So my wife came back with her, got completely radically saved that night mm -hmm. and then was coming ever since. So we were in ministry together, probably like a year before mm -hmm. we actually anything transpired or we got engaged or anything. Mm -hmm. And then I told, I basically was at a, a conference a few months after getting saved. And I was at this conference praying to myself. And I was telling God, I don't ever want to get married. I don't want a family. I'm going to be single forever because my mindset was mm -hmm. when I was in the world was like breaking up with the girlfriend, sleeping around, getting back together, breaking up, sleeping around. I was just very promiscuous. So when I got saved, I'm like, I don't want nothing to do with girls. Stay a million miles away from me. I'm never going to be married. I'm married to the ministry. I'm dedicated to the call of God. So I'm saying this to God at a conference mm -hmm. a few months after being saved. I'm never going to get married, have a family. As I'm praying that a pastor walks up to me, taps me on the shoulder. I'm like, yeah. and mind you, I'm praying in my head to God. Mm -hmm, I'm not speaking mm -hmm. nothing out loud. Mm -hmm. I say, yeah. He goes, the Lord says he has a wife for you. He has a family for you. You will be married. You will have a family. A man that finds a wife finds a good thing. And I just started crying because I'm telling God, I'm never going to be married. It's not your will. And then he confirmed. So then I told my uncle, I said, look, we don't, we're not doing no test driving. We're not doing dating a girl here, or dating a girl there two months. I told God, this was my one request to God. I said, Lord. The next person I get feelings for, because mm -hmm. this is after being saved now, I had no mm -hmm. feelings for any girls. Obviously, I broke up with my girlfriend. I said, the next person I get feelings for, Lord, I want that to be my wife. I don't want to date anybody. I don't want to do this whole six months and three months and holding mm -hmm. hands and then breaking up. And I said, so Lord, the next girl I get feelings for, I want that to be my mm -hmm. wife. And then I said, and the moment I get feelings, I'll tell my pastor. I'll confide and tell him and, and go wow. to counsel. Wow. So I told my pastor, I said, Nino. Cause again, I'm on this platform, I'm traveling mm -hmm. all this stuff. And, you know, I'm the guy, I'm the guy, the preacher, the pastor, mm -hmm. and there's all these girls coming and people coming up to me. The Lord showed me, you're going to marry my daughter. And I'm like, that's a lie. The Lord didn't show you that I'm having all these, you know, weird stuff happening. Mm -hmm. And, but I'm, I'm, my eyes are on the Lord. Never fell, never got with any girls. Mm -hmm. None of that. My wife's in the ministry for about a year. Mm -hmm. We go to Bible college together. So now I'm in Bible college. Okay. So if you guys don't know, I have a bachelor's degree in theology. So I'm in Bible college now at our local church. We had like a satellite school. So mm -hmm. it was a big Bible college, but they would basically zoom into our church and we'd have a hundred students in the Bible college. Mm -hmm. And the pastors, the speaker is talking about hearing the voice of God. And he says, I want everyone to go find an area in the room, lay down or get on your knees, basically humble yourself before God and don't get up until God speaks something to you. It could be a little impression. It could be, you know, a voice. It could be death. It could be God giving you a prayer. Pray for this person. Just get a word from God, get something. It was a whole class on prophecy. Mm -hmm. So I'll never forget. I go and lay by the drum set in this big church and I'm on my face praying, Lord, what do you have to speak to me? And I thought Vlad, it was going to be, you're going to Africa. You're going to India. Here's this. And mm -hmm. I hear it. I hear it as audible as is audible, right? Like uh, to me, it was audible. It wasn't mm -hmm. audible like the night I got saved where yeah. I was hearing it from the outside. Mm -hmm. But in my spirit, I heard an audible voice. Alyssa is your wife. And she's in Bible college with me as well at the time. So from that moment on, I knew she was going to be my wife. Feelings did started stirring up. Did I, you have feelings for her already? Or you started to get feelings uh, after you I heard mean, about I that? Didn't, I didn't have feelings like that where I was like, I want to marry you. I mm -hmm. was definitely like, she's attractive, but it wasn't anything like feelings. It wasn't like, oh, I want to marry this girl or, oh, this is going to be my wife. And remember... I told God, if I get feelings, yeah. it has to That's be my wife, be wife, right? Yeah. So from that moment on, it was like a switch turned on. I went from being, I don't ever want to be with any girls. I don't even look at a girl. Don't even mm -hmm. talk to me if you're a female to this is going to be my wife. My feelings just, wow. I had feelings immediately. I went to my pastor and said, Nino, this is what happened. Pray. Let's fast. Let's see if this is God. I know how important Vlad it is to marry the right person because yeah. who oh, you marry yeah. can ruin your ministry. Oh yeah. I knew the calling God had. I knew the mm -hmm. platform, the millions we'd reach, even though I wasn't reaching millions, I knew that was where we were going. So the most important thing was marrying the right person. Mm -hmm. So here she is. She's a year in the ministry, serving God faithfully at every prayer meeting, everything. Here I am, have these feelings. I go to my uncle. I'm getting these feelings. She goes to my uncle and is like, I'm getting these feelings for Isaiah. So we both talked to him separately <laughs> 
And then my uncle says, you guys need to not talk for, I don't, I think it was like 30 days or 40 days. You guys need to not talk to make sure it's God and not just you guys are talking because you're in ministry together. Mm -hmm. You guys need to fast and you need to make sure this is God. So I fasted. We didn't talk for, I think it was a month or 40 days. Mm -hmm. We were still in ministry together, but we weren't like talking at Mm -hmm. all. And all of a sudden, boom, boom, God confirmed it. I sat with her parents. I kid you not. And said, can I ask your daughter to marry me? And her parents had got saved in the revival. So Uh her parents were in the revival after Alyssa got saved. Her parents got saved. And they said, of course, we want you to marry our daughter. So I asked her dad's hand in marriage. We didn't date, Vlad. I got to be clear. We didn't date. We didn't go out alone on dates. We, We basically just talked. We went through premarital counseling. And then at a revival service, we had a guest speaker. I got on stage. There were 700 people there. And I asked her to marry me right there in front of everybody. Everyone mm-hmm. was shocked because we never dated. We got mm-hmm. engaged and two and a half months later, we got married and we just celebrated 11 years of marriage. We have four beautiful kids and I, she was the only girl I ever had feelings for. I never did any like messing around. I never fell mm-hmm. into sin with uh, other girls doing this or that. Wow. That was it. I had my eyes on her. We got, we got engaged, never dated, got engaged, got married two and a half months later at the church, huge wedding, 600 people came and we've been happily married for 11 years and never, never gone back to drinking, cussing, Mm. pornography, never fallen into any compromise. I have zero money scandals, sexual scandals, none of that. I'm, I'm happily married. She's the love of my life. She's in the chat. She's amazing. And I'll tell you guys this, let me say this last thing, and then you can move on to the next thing. I would not be who I am without her. Mm-hmm. everything you see is only because i have the support of a loving wife mm-hmm. that prays for me that fasts for me that's in my corner like behind every guy behind me behind vlad you see us on the platform you see us on the stage on the live there's a woman of god that is praying us through that is speaking the word of god over us and many times the voice of god has sounded like my wife's voice many times my wife has said oh you shouldn't do that mm-hmm. oh you should do that uh, she's encouraged me to do things she's discouraged me from some things and mm-hmm. i'm telling you 100 percent of the time it always is right. And so she's just been an amazing mother, an amazing homekeeper, an amazing wife. And uh, yeah, praise come the on, Lord for come her. Come on, come on. And Alyssa is in the chat. We honor you, um, Alyssa, and as well, um, Isaiah. You know, I really honor, you know, the, the purity of your life, uh, the concentra- consecration of your life. I remember when Matt stayed in my house, actually. And um, I think actually it was Matt who introduced me, uh, who introduced you to me. And he, well, he told me that, you know, kind of connection to you and how he stayed in your house and, you know, spoke very, very honoring and as well as just your commitment to Christ. You know, what you guys see is what you get. Isaiah is not a two-faced person where there's one person on the stage, another person off the stage. And I've had, I think in the last 12 months, I think I've shared stage with you more than probably with any other uh, person Come on. from the Demon Slayers. And I can testify to that that not only that you love Jesus and you're super radical, but you also speak very fast in person as well. This <laughs> is not everything. a this is not a preaching voice. At first I thought it was just, you know, like some people have a preaching Everybody co- does. voice and then like you g- talk with them and they actually speak normal. Isaiah is actually like that. He is not normal. He's just radical <laughs> all the time, nonstop. And so, and but the amazing part is, you know, it's one thing to be radical. It's another thing to have a life and longevity backing up mm. your radical because we know people who are radical and they're like these shooting stars they shoot up yes. over there and then you know next year they get divorced then then they have adultery then they have a money scandal then they have that stuff and they're not stable they're not uh, theologically sound they're not grounded they're not undercovering and i think it gives a bad rap to what the lord is doing in some circles and in some places through young people and so having you coming from that rough life but i think having a solid family having a covering of your uncle, your pastor, and then having a stable, solid, healthy marriage. Because if your marriage is not healthy, no matter how big your ministry is, no matter how popular you are, anointed you are, you can prophesy paint off the walls. But if you can't relate with your wife, you can speak in tongues, but if you can't speak in English or in whatever language that you're speaking with your spouse and there is no harmony, there's no intimacy. I mean, that revival has a short uh, term. And so in the Come fact on. that you're walking and there's a longevity in that, you know, that to me is a big testament and testimony. And I'm really honored, 
you know, to call you a friend and to observe your life, not only from a distance as I did before, but now very up close and seeing how you handle everything, how you manage, um, you know, the struggles and the other things that you go through. You know, all of us come under heavy attacks sometimes from the online yeah. and you kind of, you know, you stay quiet. You don't, you don't get into that drama. And to me, that's huge and stuff. So seeing you, mm. you know, even though I think you're younger than me, Right. I'm 32. How old are you? I'm 37. So you're technically oh, yeah. my younger brother, I'm but younger. I I'm do look youngest. up. I do look up to you um, in many areas, and I honor you and I respect you. My question: You mentioned about the dream or the vision that God gave you about preaching in North Korea. Do you think that's gonna happen? You think? Uh, what? I don't know. You know, I did have that vision of me preaching in North Korea. I've always had a heart for North Korea. I uh -huh. think too. I was watching a lot of documentaries about how they were the struggle that they go through there uh -huh. being the nation being locked down and the dictator basically starving the people everything happening in north korea so that was my first vision ever was preaching in north korea okay. so if the lord would have it someday i'm willing i'm ready but yeah i definitely had that was my first vision was seeing north korea and i saw a vision of basically everybody there was gray and almost looked you know, very pale and death-like. Mm -hmm. And then I saw the Lord bringing color and bringing light to that entire nation and liberating mm -hmm. that entire nation. So is okay. that 10 years from now, five years, three years, 20 years? Or I maybe, don't know. maybe it will happen. Know. Maybe it will happen through online. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Or through the online. So I'm praying and believing that we'll, we'll be able to reach them someday. What are some of your, what are you, what is your dreams or your vision? What do you think God is going to do? Yeah, so my dreams and visions, it kind of goes back to what we just talked about, is raising godly kids. Right now, my focus is my four daughters, is raising them up in God. My When I pass away, Vlad, mm -hmm. yeah, there will be books, there will be videos, there will be this, but there's no U-Haul behind my hearse. The only thing left after I leave is my kids. Mm. The only thing left is my legacy. And so I want to raise my kids in the ways of God. I want to make sure my kids know me better than people in the green room know me. I want to make mm. sure my kids aren't like, oh yeah, that was my dad who was never home, mm. who's always gone gone preaching, who basically we saw passing by. Like, I really want to disciple my kids, to pour into my kids. Just today, I was supposed to be getting filming done and videos done this afternoon. And I was got home from getting a haircut and my wife was reading her Bible and I sat down in my bed and my wife and my uh, three-year-old were in bed sitting there, my wife was reading. And I sat down and my three-year-old laid on me and fell asleep on me. And I was just laying there going, I'm supposed to be filming a video. I have all this stuff to do. And I let her sleep on me for an hour. Just, man, this mm. is the best. My three-year-old sleeping on me is better than the views wow. and the videos and the numbers and the flyers and whatever. Like, this is mm. the true calling that God has given me. So I've, I've had a little bit of tension of trying to do everything God's called me to do on this side with the online, with the traveling. Mm -hmm. And this is why a lot of you have seen me pull away from the traveling is because I'm like, okay, I want to give this to my family. I want to give them, you know, I have this a little bit of years before they're grown and gone. When they're mm -hmm. grown and gone, I can go travel, do whatever. But mm -hmm. I really want to pour into my wife, pour into my kids and be present mm -hmm. and be there for them and disciple them. Like, how am I going to disciple the world and not disciple my own kids? Or how am I going to see the world save and not my own kids? So that's been a it's big work. focus. And honestly, when people say, what's your ministry dream? This might sound cliche. It might not be the answer you're looking for. Or the chat is looking for if my four daughters mm. serve the Lord, I will be mission accomplished. I would trade a million subscribers, 25 bestseller New York Times books. I would trade everything just for my four daughters to serve the Lord. That is my absolute dream. If I could get to where they're all, you know, gr grown up, have their own kids out of the house, all of them serving God. Mm -hmm. To me, I'm retired. That's mission accomplished, wow. baby. I'm done. I'm ready to be with the Lord. I left a legacy. That's really my dream. Of course, I have dreams of ministry, of reaching people and writing books and seeing the lost saved and reaching the party animals and reaching the lukewarm Christians. And I believe we're in that mm -hmm. moment. I believe we're yeah. in this end time last days. Mm -hmm. And some of you might say, well, maybe it isn't the last days and we can argue, but I want to tell everyone in the chat, it's your last days. Every wow. one of us, Vlad, are That's in our word. last days. That's it might word, not be Isaiah. the last days, mm -hmm. but we all are in our last days. We might die tomorrow. I don't know. I That's could die tonight. And I, I just want to live my life with mm -hmm. eternity in mind every day saying, Lord, I want to serve you. I want to worship you. I want to live a quiet, clean life. Mm -hmm. That's what the Bible says to do. Live a quiet, clean life, mm -hmm. waiting for the Lord's return and doing everything he wants me to do. But yeah, that's my goal is raising my kids in God, having a healthy marriage and ha ha healthy kids. To me, that's the ultimate dream. Isaiah, can you uh, speak and lead into prayer? I know yes. that we don't uh, believe in the sinner's prayer, but we know the sinners pray. And um, 
Could you speak to someone who's maybe like you right now, who grew up in church and walked away from Christ, is living a life of partying, living a life that is completely not pleasing to Jesus. They will not spend eternity with God if they die like this. Somebody's praying for them. Can you speak with them and lead them to a relationship with Christ? Yes. So first of all, I want to say you're never going to fill your void with a car, with a job, with a house, with a career, with a girlfriend. Some of you watching this right now, you think that you're only unhappy because you haven't gotten the job or you haven't gotten the award or you haven't gotten the degree. And you think once I get the nicer car, once I get hired as the sheriff, once I get hired as the police officer, that's what I used to think. Once I become the deputy, once I become this, then I'll be happy. But not realizing there is a God sized void in your life right now. Nothing you pursue will leave you happy. Nothing you pursue. Jesus said, if you drink of me, I will give you living water. Amen. And when you drink this water, you'll never thirst again. Friend, I want to tell you 13 years ago, I came to a well and drank of the living water mm. and I've never been thirsty since. For, for years, for 19 years, I chased this, I chased that. I thought, if I get with this girl, if I get with this person, if I go here, if I get graduate high school at 16, I'll be happy. If I graduate college at 19, which I did, I'll be happy. If I get a good girlfriend, if I get a nice car, if I get a good job, and I did all of those things. And I was 19 about to buy a house and do this and way ahead of everybody in my world. Yet I was empty, I was broken, I was depressed, I was sleeping till one o'clock because I didn't want to get out of bed. I was addicted to alcohol. I was addicted to pornography. I was a lost, hurting, broken human being. And it wasn't until I looked at what Jesus did on the cross, said, God, I'll give you everything if you're real. I turn from my sin. You must repent. Acts chapter two, verse 38. What must we do to be saved? Mm -hmm. Some of you watching this, you're like, okay, I get it. You're talking. It's been an hour and 20 minutes, but what must I do to be saved? Peter said, you must repent. Yeah. You have to turn from your sin. Mm -hmm. You can't say, Lord, I'll serve you and then keep living that life of sin. Repentance is metanoia. It's changing the way you think. Mm -hmm. And this is what it is. I'm wrong about God. I need to change the way I think. So for me, when I was at that altar, it was repentance was this. I'm wrong about God. I thought God wasn't real. I thought God didn't care. I thought God was lame and boring. When I repented, I said, God, I'm wrong about you. I'm going to change the way I think. And now I'm going to put my faith in the finished work of the cross. Mm -hmm. It is only when you put your faith in the finished work mm -hmm. of the cross as when you truly can become born again. Mm -hmm. So wherever you're watching from right now, repent of your sin in your own way. Say, Lord, I'll give you everything. God, I want to turn to you. There's no other way to do it, friend. You must turn from your sin. You must lay everything down. Jesus said, if any man wants to follow me, he must die to himself. He must mm -hmm. surrender. He must deny himself. Pick up his cross and follow me. So this is a life of fully surrendering, 100% in. There's no such thing as being half in. There's no such thing as being 99.9%. .9%. You have to give everything to God right now and say, Lord, I'll give you my life. And when you do that, you become a new creature. And the Bible says the old has passed away. And here's the best news ever. You can die. The old man can die. Mm -hmm. The depressed you, the anxious you, the bitter you, the uh, racist Man. you, the hard-hearted, cold you gets to die. And the Bible says a new man is resurrected. So Jesus actually offers you to get on the cross with him, mm -hmm. die with him and be resurrected in burial with him and then be resurrected into new life. Mm -hmm. That's what he's offering today. So in your own words, I want you right now to say, Lord, I repent of my sins. Yes, Lord, God. I turn to you. God, I want to serve you. God, I want to know you. God, reveal yourself to me. God, show yourself to me. I'll, I'll do whatever it takes, Lord. Reveal yourself to me. Repent today. Turn from your sin. And then I want you to get involved in a local church. I want you to get what the Bible says, Acts 2.38, be baptized. You need to get baptized. Mm -hmm. This is a command Jesus gives us. It's not what gets you salvation, but it's proof that you've received salvation. Mm -hmm. Baptism doesn't come before, then you're saved. Baptism comes after you're saved. It's a sign of what God's done inwardly. You do mm -hmm. outwardly. It's symbolic, just like the Israel, children of Israel went through the Red Sea and God drowned those Philistines. When you get baptized, God drowns that Philistine. God drowns mm -hmm. the old man. Mm -hmm. So you need to get baptized. So right now, I just want to pray for you. If you've said, I repent, I turn from my sin, then the best thing could happen to you is you get filled with the Holy Spirit. Yes. This is what Acts 2.38 says. You can be baptized. And this is not just a promise for you, but for your children and your children and your children to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So you're here, you maybe you're crying, maybe you're not. Maybe you say, oh, Lord, I'm turning from my sin. I'm tired of my sin. I'm getting rid of my vape. I'm getting rid of my bong. I'm getting rid of my drugs. I'm getting rid of my pornography, my alcohol. 
and I want to serve you fully. Let me say this prayer over you, and I'm going to pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In the book of John, it says, if you ask, if you thirst, he'll give you rivers mm -hmm. of living water. He will give you, but you have to be hungry. Jesus said in mm -hmm. Luke 11, if you being evil, give good gifts, how much more does the heavenly father want to give the Holy Spirit to those that ask? Before you get the Holy Spirit, though, you need to repent according to Peter in Acts 2. So you repent, then you receive the Holy Spirit. So right now, you've repented. It's time to receive the Holy Spirit. Just put your hands out like you're receiving a gift and just be in a mode ready to receive. And we're going to mm -hmm. pray for a filling of the Holy Spirit. Father, I come before you right now humbly. And I pray, Lord, that every single person tonight that has repented and that has asked and that is hungry for you, I pray, Lord, that you would baptize them in the Holy Spirit and fire. Mm -hmm. I pray right now from the top of your head to the soles of your feet mm -hmm. that you'd receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, just like in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 19, the power of the Holy Ghost would come upon you. Be baptized right now in the Holy Spirit and fire. Lord, we just pray, fill them right now with your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that you would break off the chains. You'd break off the shame. You'd break off the guilt mm -hmm. and the condemnation. Lord, every unclean spirit that's trying to hinder them and hold them back, we cast you out now in Jesus' name. Every foul spirit, go in Jesus' name. Come on. Satan, you have no power. Satan, you've lost this battle. Your reign of terror is over. The devil will no longer have power to terrorize you. We break his power. We sever his roots. We sever his ties. And I pray for some of you that hope would arise. Mm. Those of you in the chat, I'm getting a word of knowledge. You've lost hope. You have no hope. Even with what's going on in Israel, you've lost hope. Your heart has grown cold. But God says it's time to hope again. It's time to dream again. It's time to prophesy. It's time to see visions that there is an outpouring for all flesh. God says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. God is saying it's time to prophesy. Mm. It's time to pray in the spirit. It's time to walk in the word of knowledge. No more laziness, says God. Mm. Get off the couch. No more sidelines. Get involved at your local church. Start a prayer meeting in your home. Start evangelizing on the streets. Get radical for God. Start praying. Start fasting. It's time. Right now is your time. Where's my sign? This is your sign right now. This mm. is your sign to go on for God. And I hear the Lord saying, don't wait for tomorrow. Do not wait for tomorrow. You can't afford it. You don't have tomorrow. The Bible says only a full plans for tomorrow. Tomorrow's not promised. We don't even plan for tomorrow because tomorrow's not promised. Mm -hmm. I feel an urgency. Mm -hmm. Now's the day of salvation. Today's the day to go all in for God. Right now, make that choice. Yes, Say, God, I want to go all in for you. And maybe, I'm not going to tell you what it is. Maybe the Lord's going to say, hey, there's some unholy things in your house. Mm -hmm. There's some unholy things in your house, in your life. Now, it might not be a Harry Potter DVD at the bottom of a laundry basket, but it might be something in your life. Remember, you are a temple, a house of the Holy Spirit, and there might be areas in your life that offend God, that grieve God, and that quench the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that bad speech grieves the Holy Spirit. The Bible says the way that we live could grieve the Holy Spirit. So right now, just say, Lord, is there something I'm watching? that's grieving you? Is there something I'm listening to that's grieving you? Is there something I'm saying? Maybe it's gossip or dirty jokes that's grieving mm -hmm. you. Holy Spirit, I, I don't want to grieve you. Mm -hmm. I don't want to make you mad. I don't want to make you mm -hmm. cry. I don't want to, Lord, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm turning pornography. It grieves God. Friend, if you're addicted to pornography, you're grieving the Holy Spirit. The Bible says you got to turn, run from lust. Someone, someone needs to hear this in the chat. Mm -hmm. Run from mm -hmm. lust. Don't even try to sit there and try to fight it. Just run, flee, get Amen. away, get rid of it. If, it. if it caused you to sin, get rid of it. So tonight is the night. Yes, Lord. Lord, touch your people. Anoint your people, the Holy Spirit and fire. And I pray, let me pray one last thing, Vlad. I pray revivals would start in living rooms. Mm. I pray revival would start in minivans. Mm. I pray revival would start in houses. I pray that God would light your house on mm. fire. Think about it. You spend an hour and a half at church and you spend the other 160 plus hours at home. Where mm -hmm. is it God's going to ignite? If you're a stay-at-home mom, you're home 150 hours during the week and you're only at church for an hour and a half. And a lot of us are praying for revival at church when God says, I want revival where you're actually at, at mm -hmm. your house, at your home. So it's time for revival. Some of you, I see some of you grown men, you get off of work and I get it. You want to decompress. Turn on the television, ignore your kids. You're tired, you're wore out. But the Lord says, I'm going to give you strength. And I see some of you grown men, mm -hmm. when you get off of work, 
You're not going to run to kick your feet up and Amen. watch the UFC fight, but you're going to say, hey, let's have some living room prayer. And God is going to give you rest and peace. And he's going to be the one that decompresses you. You're no longer going to need the UFC. You're no longer going to need the fantasy football to decompress. You're no longer going to need the, the video games for four hours. But God says he will be your refuge. He will be your resting place. And you're going to get home from work and he's going to be your vacation. You're going to get your family in prayer. You're going to start praying for your kids. You're going to start doing Bible study with your kids. You're going to start reading the Bible together with your spouse. You know, me and my wife have been doing this 90-day Bible, and we've been reading almost every single night the Bible together. And it's beautiful. It's amazing. We've never done that before. And now for the last 40 days, every night we lay in bed together, and we're reading the Bible. God wants to do that in your marriage, in your family, in your life. God wants to touch your house Come right on. now. Why is it your house could be a place for this and that, and you have parties at your house, you have hangouts at your house, you have TV at your house, you have birthdays at your house, but you don't have prayer. Mm. You don't have revival. You don't have holiness. So God wants to move in. Yes, invite the Holy Spirit. One thing about the Holy Spirit is he doesn't like showing up in places he's not invited. Mm -hmm. Invite the Holy Spirit into Amen. your house, into your life, and he will touch you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Sorry, Vlad. I felt the Amen. fire, man. I just kept going there. <laughs> just took off. Come on, somebody. Come on, everybody. Drop that fire emoji if you really enjoyed this. Isaiah just brought the fire today. Uh, my friend, thank you so much. I honor you. Love you, man. I appreciate, I appreciate you for having you. me on. I love everybody in the chat, all your people. I'm honored to be on. I don't take it lightly. Thank you. And we'll connect more afterwards. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, bro. See uh -huh. you guys. Love you guys.